Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us. I'm Dr. Jennifer Waters, and I use she and her pronouns. I'm a former nutrition support and critical care dietitian, and currently I do wear a lot of hats. I'm a regional internship director for Sodexo and an adjunct professor for Northern Illinois University, Towson University, and University of Rhode Island. My primary research area focuses on health and nutritional care of transgender and gender diverse patient population. We are excited to talk to you today about conducting nutrition-focused physical examinations, or NFPEs, when working with transgender patients. Joining me for this discussion is Dr. Whitney Linsenmeyer. And hi, everyone. My name is Dr. Whitney Linsenmeyer. I also use she, her pronouns, and I am an assistant professor and the DPD director at St. Louis University, and I also serve as a spokesperson for the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, and my research and clinical practice center on gender-affirming nutrition care for the transgender and gender-expansive population, and I'm particularly interested in nutrition assessment for gender-expansive patients. In this video, we will be sharing with you some important things to consider when conducting NFPEs on transgender patients, including the use of gender-affirming communication and applying a trauma-informed approach when conducting the physical exam. Dr. Linsenmeyer will be discussing a variety of physical changes that you might expect to observe when examining patients who are undergoing a gender-affirming medical or surgical transition. We'll get into the details of the NFPE in a moment, but the most important piece is to establish rapport with your patient. This is important for all patients, but especially transgender patients who we know are frequently mistreated by healthcare providers. So let's begin by reviewing some best practices for introducing yourself and conducting the patient interview. It is always a good idea to introduce yourself using your pronouns. This generally opens the door for your patient to do the same thing. You can also simply ask your patient what pronouns and names that they would like you to use. It is important to avoid making any assumptions about your patient's gender identity based on how they present physically or by their name or any other demographic data in their electronic health record. When your patient shares their pronouns and name with you, it is important to make every effort to address them accordingly. If you do make a mistake and use the wrong pronouns or name, the best course of action is to briefly apologize and move along using the correct name and pronouns going forward. Using your patient's pronouns and preferred name is a great way to affirm their gender identity. When discussing with your patient their health and nutrition history, it is important that you stick to only the questions that are pertinent to the care that you are providing. Studies examining ex experiences of transgender patients in the healthcare environment have indicated that healthcare providers sometimes seem to ask irrelevant questions just to satisfy their own curiosity. It is understandable that this type of questioning could easily make a patient feel very uncomfortable. Typically, the questions we ask when we interview patients are important pieces of our assessment, but these same questions could come across to the patient as unnecessary or even intrusive. That said, it's a good practice to explain the questions and how they connect to the patient's nutritional care. When it comes time to conduct the NFPE, dietitians should consider using a gender-affirming and trauma-informed approach. To affirm one's gender, you can continue to use the patient's correct pronouns and name, as well as trying to use inclusive language and gender-neutral terms whenever possible. For example, you can use the term chest tissue instead of breast tissue. The transgender community does experience trauma at a disproportionate rate. In fact, transgender individuals are four times more likely to be the victim of violent crimes, including physical and sexual assault. Additionally, there is often a layer of underlying stress and trauma that is associated with being part of a marginalized community. The trauma-informed framework is an approach to caring for patients that acknowledges the pervasive impact of trauma recognizes the signs and symptoms, and promotes healing and recovery while actively avoiding re-traumatizing the patient. Using this approach, it is a best practice to clearly explain to your patient what an NFPE is and what it entails. This involves explaining the purpose of the exam, how it applies to their care, and informing them that the exam does involve some physical contact, detailing how and where you are requesting to touch them, and if you may need to remove or loosen any of their clothing or pull back their hospital gown in any way. For example, you could briefly explain 
A nutrition-focused physical exam is an exam that's done by the dietitian to make sure that you have a good amount of healthy muscle and fat tissue and that you are getting enough vitamins and minerals in your diet. I would ask to examine your face, hair, nails, and areas such as your arms, legs, shoulder, back, and collarbone. I would be lightly touching these areas as part of my exam like this, and you can show them yourself. I may also at some point request to move your hospital gown slightly to be able to see these areas a little bit better, but I will make sure to also explain everything as we go. Once you thoroughly explain the NFPE process, you should kindly ask the patient for permission to proceed. If they do not provide you with their permission or refuse the exam, you must honor their request and continue your nutrition assessment without the NFPE. If they do provide you with their permission, it is important to let them know that it is okay to ask you to pause or stop the exam at any time should they begin to feel uncomfortable. Some patients may be afraid to disclose their discomfort, and so it's always a good practice to pay attention to your patient's nonverbal cues before and during the exam. Should you happen to notice that your patient is displaying signs of discomfort, such as tensing up their muscles, crying, trembling, cowering, or if their breathing becomes more rapid, it is a good idea to pause the exam, give them a moment and a little bit of space, and ask them if there's anything that you can do to make them feel more comfortable. And when appropriate to resume the exam, you should ask for permission once again to proceed. During the exam, it is a good practice to continue to explain each part of the exam before you proceed with it and do some permission checks through, throughout the exam. As an example, you could say something like, so next I'm going to gently touch the areas around your eyes and cheekbones to make sure that you have a healthy amount of fat tissue there. Would that be okay with you? It's a good idea to try and stay within the patient's line of sight and do everything that you can to respect their personal space. You can do this by being efficient so that the exam is not prolonged, by using professional touch, by avoiding any sudden movements, and by exposing parts of their body only as absolutely necessary for the purpose of the exam, while then repositioning any clothing, gowns, or drapes back to their original placement as soon as you can. These are just a few ways that we can try and make our patients more comfortable under our care. So by applying approaches that are both gender affirming and trauma informed, we can hopefully provide transgender patients with a positive and inclusive experience, making them feel safe and welcome and building rapport and providing them with excellent nutrition care. Now I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Linsenmeyer who will help us interpret some of the physical changes we might observe during the NFPE. Thanks, Jen. So the next piece that we'll address is the physical changes in patients who are medically transitioning. So we'll talk about gender-affirming hormone therapy and surgeries and how those things may impact body size, body composition, body shape, as well as the hair, skin, and nails. So first, gender-affirming hormone therapy. If you're not familiar with hormone therapy, this is a treatment where patients take hormones such as estrogen or testosterone, that help achieve physical characteristics that are more masculine or feminine. I always refer to the Endocrine Society guidelines for those exact physical changes, which are published as open access. So these detail the effects of hormone therapy, the anticipated onset, or basically when they start, and then when each change is anticipated to reach its maximum effect. For example, Changes with testosterone-based hormone therapy include an increase in skin oiliness and acne, facial and body hair growth, scalp hair loss, cessation of menses, and deepening of the voice. Changes with estrogen-based hormone therapy include softening of skin and decreased oiliness, breast growth, and decreased volume of the testes. It's important to keep in mind that not all patients who identify as transgender will be on hormone therapy. In other words, we shouldn't assume that just because a patient identifies as trans that they are on testosterone or estrogen. Rather, we can gather this data as part of our full nutrition assessment and the list of any medications that they may be taking. So in addition to the changes that I just mentioned, there are some key physical changes with hormone therapy that are highly relevant to the NFPE. In short, we expect a patient's body size, body composition, and body shape to change in specific ways. And I'll emphasize too, these are often changes that patients are happy to see as hormone therapy is bringing aspects of their body into better alignment with their gender expression. So for testosterone-based hormone therapy, 
These changes include increased muscle mass and strength, decreased fat mass, a net weight gain, and also fat redistribution. So we generally see an increase in the waist to hip ratio. And then with estrogen-based hormone therapy, these changes include decrease in muscle mass and strength, increased fat mass, also a net weight gain, and again, fat re redistribution. But this time we generally see a decrease in the waist to hip ratio. And it's important to note that the magnitude and the rate of changes in body weight and body, body size um, and body composition, these may vary widely among patients on hormone therapy. The current estimate from a meta-analysis by Claver and colleagues is a net weight gain of like less than five pounds within a year of first initiating hormone therapy. But I've worked with patients who have gained up to 60 pounds within the first couple of years. Meanwhile, a prospective cohort study reported no changes in body composition in 20% of people who were on testosterone-based hormone therapy and 9% of those who were on estrogen-based hormone therapy. So again, highly individualized in terms of the magnitude and the rate of those changes. So for the NFPE, we want to keep in mind that hormone therapy is just one factor that may cause changes in a patient's body size, composition, and shape, and should be con considered alongside other medications that the patient may be taking. A few additional things to keep front of mind. When decreased muscle mass is expected with estrogen-based hormone therapy, it's important to assess the quantity and quality of the muscle tissue. When increased fat mass is expected, especially with those who are on estrogen-based hormone therapy, we can keep in mind that that increased fat mass may make it more difficult to assess the muscle tissue, but that palpation can still be used to assess for loose skin or loss of fullness. So ultimately, if you're considering a diagnosis of malnutrition on the basis of fat loss, muscle wasting, or unintentional weight loss, you can consider whether those changes are directly related to um, hormone therapy, poor nutrition, or even a combination of the two. So now this is a great time to talk about patient-centered goals. Medically transitioning with hormone therapy is often described as this second puberty. It's this rapid period of physical changes. What a great opportunity to talk to your patient about what they want for their body size and shape and how nutrition and physical activity can play a supportive role in meeting their goals. Okay, so we've talked mostly about hormone therapy so far. Now we'll switch gears to touch on considerations for gender-affirming surgeries. We know that surgical history is an important part of the patient's overall medical history. Some of the gender-affirming surgeries that a patient may undergo are designed to masculinize or feminize the chest region, so like a breast augmentation as an example, the genital region or reproductive organs, like a hysterectomy, the facial region, or the vocal cords. So for a good reference on gender-affirming surgeries, I always turn to the WPATH Standards of Care version 8, and those are coming from the World Professional Association for Transgender Health. So the important thing here is that just like any other type of surgery, the regions of the body that we're typically assessing for fat and muscle may be impacted. And we simply have to choose a different site to assess. So for example, a facial fe feminization surgery may make it difficult to assess fat pads of the face. So this just may warrant assessing a different part of the body for fat loss. This is really no different than any other patient who has undergone a surgery that is impacting assessment of a particular site of the body. We simply use a different site for assessment. And just making sure that we've collected a thorough surgical history and just looking up any surgeries that we may not be familiar with so we will help to be prepared before conducting the NFPE. So then lastly, I just want to touch briefly on the skin and hair changes that are expected with hormone therapy. Again, I'm referencing those endocrine society guidelines here. So with testosterone-based therapy, we expect to see skin oiliness or acne, facial and body hair growth, and scalp hair loss. And with estrogen-based therapy, we expect to see softening of the skin and decreased oiliness, and then variable effects on scalp hair. I'll also note here that patients may also use um, techniques like electrolysis and laser hair removal to permanently remove undesired hair. So just like those changes in body weight and body composition, we can consider that any changes in skin and hair in the top context of medications or procedures that the patient may be taking or have completed. So that wraps up the major physical changes that we want to be attuned to with gender-affirming hormone therapies and surgeries. 
we want to leave you with three key takeaways. RDNs can use a gender-affirming and trauma-informed approach to conducting a patient interview and physical exam to provide a safe, comfortable, and inclusive patient experience. Second is that RDNs can know what physical changes are expected with hormone therapy and how surgeries may impact our ability to assess fat and muscle at different sites. And thirdly, that RDNs are trained to collect a full medical history. This includes any medications and surgeries that will inform the NFPE and may include hormone therapy and gender affirming surgeries. If you're interested in reading more about this topic, we have an article that was recently published in the Journal of the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, and a link to that article will be published in the description of the video. Okay, so we'll conclude by reminding you that RDNs can provide an excellent experience for their transgender and gender expansive patients. Thanks so much for watching, and we'll see you next time. Thank you.